Thanks everybody for coming this evening. I see a lot of friends, some neighbors. Ida Weller's grandson and great granddaughter are in the audience tonight. We were talking with them. That's an honor. Anyway, welcome to everybody. I'm glad you're here. If you've seen this downtown, this is the latest Centerville mural. It's on the side of the Meridian that used to be Sweeney's. And the young lady that painted this went to Weller School and she put Ida Weller right in the middle as an homage to her from going to her school. And I was wondering, gee, how many people drive by and don't have a clue who Ida Weller is? We hope to tell you a little bit of that tonight, so I hope you enjoy it. Ida Albrecht, their name was originally Albrecht and they changed it to Albright. Their homestead was where Bethany Village is now, over 100 acres, and that was the, the Albright homestead there. And this is her as a young girl. She married Arthur Weller, and this is their nicknames. She called him Cap, and he called her Spike. I don't know where those nicknames came from. And Ida had three children, Robert, Margaret Elizabeth, and Samuel. And unfortunately, only Robert outlived Ida and carried on the family name and passed it on to other family members. We're pretty sure this is Robert, since he's the only boy in the picture. And probably a couple of the girls are there, but uh, we don't really know. But this is Ida, no question about that. On the front door of the house is this door knocker, and it says Weller's 1897 to 1947. That was from their 50th anniversary, and it's still on the door today. And this is them at their golden uh, wedding anniversary. Ida always liked to study. She studied her whole life. She went to a one-room schoolhouse, schoolhouse number four. She went to the Washington Township High School, the third class in 1893. And that's the building that today is the Brunch Pub. A year ago, it was Las Pyramides, but that was the original Centerville High School. And that's where Ida graduated from in 1893. She went to Ohio Northern in Ada, Ohio to get her teaching certificate. Very unusual for teachers to get an actual teaching certificate and be trained to teach. Most of them just had a high school education and would, would teach, but she actually went to the effort to get a teaching certificate. She went to Colonel White Adult School, which gave her some ideas about adult school of her own later on. And she always wanted a college degree. So at the age of 50, she went to the University of Dayton and got her bachelor's degree in 1932. She also took miscellaneous classes at Miami University, Wittenberg, and four years of French in the YMCA. How she has the time to do all this and everything else is beyond me, but she was a very studious person. This is her teacher's certificate from 1895. And it's interesting, the subjects I was shocked that in 1895, they were teaching alcohol and narcotics. You know, you think of that as a recent problem, but in 1895, they wanted to teach teachers how to deal with that in the classroom. So that's her certificate from the normal school. Here she is at the age of 50. She's over here where the arrow is, right here graduating from UD. Not a lot of women, and especially at her age, graduating back in those days. Here she is as a school teacher. Here she is on the left, and all her kids are all lined up. She was at schoolhouse number eight. She only taught three years there. She was ill and had to quit teaching after three years, but she continued on after that. This is a blurry picture, but this is the schoolhouse. This is what all the one-room schoolhouses looked like in Washington Township in those days. There were nine back then, and there's only about three still in existence today. Centerville Adult School, this is her proudest achievement. She knew that all the farmers in the area who she had um, a great feelings for never had the chance to get a, an education because they were up at dawn milking the cows and they were out in the fields all day long and they worked till dark at night. So they didn't get a chance to get to school and get an education. 
So she started an adult school and it was, it was quite an event. And it was, it was held at that same building, the old high school. She invited people from all walks of life to come to this. And one of them that was a little, little iffy was uh, Lewis Bromfield, who is right up here. He has a farm called Malabar up in Northern Ohio. Um, and he used to hobnob with a bunch of Hollywood uh, types. Uh, Bogart and Bacall got married on his farm up there. But he was a socialist and had some kind of wild ideas. It took her five years writing letters to him to get him to come down and speak at her adult school. And when he did, it caused a lot of uproar because he talked about socialism and birth control and things that people didn't talk about too much in those days. But Ida said, if you don't know what socialism is, how do you know you don't want it? So you got to learn about it and then say, that's not what I want to do. And so that's why she had him down. That was her proudest achievement. That's good old Lewis right there again. She started in 1934 and it went on for 30 years. Charged each family a dollar per year to go to it. Clergyman, scientists, industrialists, Lewis Bromfield, George Verity, the founder of Armco Steel, Richard Grant, who had Grant Farms where Normandy Church is now. He was one of her speakers. Michael DeSalle, the former Ohio governor. So she had, this is just a very small list. She had hundreds of speakers over the 30 years, uh, anywhere she could get them and conjole them to come and speak at her school. She was an educator. These are some of the subjects. This is one of the letters that she sent around to tell people to come to her school. These are some of the subjects and they went from world affairs to poultry raising to motor mechanics and charm. That's my favorite one. She had, <laughs> she had a little charm in there. So she covered all the bases. But even with all that fanfare, she always just said, I'm just a farmer's wife. And there was 160 acres off of Clio Road was their farm. She had 3,500 chickens and they sold eggs for many, many years. Anybody here ever go get eggs from the egg farm? There you are there. Bill Gall used to, he's in the back there. I've run into people all the time who said they used to get their eggs there. And as the story goes, they used to take fresh eggs to downtown Dayton Reich's bakery and beginning with a, in a horse and buggy. Every morning, fresh eggs downtown to Reich's bakery from their chickens. They also had horses, cattle and hogs. Just a couple years before we bought the place and they were starting to build new, new houses around the smaller spot, the neighbors said, yeah, we could hear, the, we could, we could hear the, the cows mooing in there. So it wasn't long ago that it was still active. This is the sign that used to hang out on Clio Road, Weller's Farm Fresh Eggs. And this is Ida out in the chicken house working with her chickens. And when she was out in the chicken house or in her gardens, which were massive, working on the farm, she, she wore trousers. Oh my gosh, what a scandal. Back in those days, no reputable woman would be caught in anything but a long dress all the way to the floor. But she said, makes sense to her when she's out there shoveling stuff in the chicken house, she ought to be wearing pants. And she did, but people talked about her. See underneath the sign, it says, there's a difference that was their copyrighted slogan. It was on all of their egg cartons and everything. You've heard of Eglin's Best? You know the little eggs that have a little stamp on them? Well, when Eglin's Best first came out, and I'm not sure when that was, maybe the 70s, their first national ad said, Eglin's Best, there's a difference. Judy and her lawyer get them on the phone say, no, 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 you can't, that's copyrighted. We got, there is a difference. You can't say that. And they go, okay. And so they don't advertise that anymore because Weller's Farm Fresh Eggs had it first. She was quite the chicken breeder. She just didn't have chickens and throw feed at them. She worked with the Ohio State Extension Service and was always experimenting with, with different kind of feeds. And, and in the barn today is a corn grinder and sheller that she used to grind and make her own chicken feed. And she tried all kinds of different things. And I heard that one of the things she liked to try was cod liver oil. 
put a bunch of that in there. It's good for the chickens. And sometimes would line up the grandkids. I don't know if they, he's raising his hand, would line up the grandkids and say, if this is good enough for the chickens, it's good enough for you. And they didn't appreciate that much. These pictures are all many, many photographs that we have uh, given to us because she was quite the photographer. She did all this photographer herself. And on many of these pictures, there's little notes at the bottom that tell how many eggs they did and what period of time she kept meticulous records of all of that and, and how they did with their different feeds. She belonged to all of these different farmers' organizations, Farmers Avenue, Farm Bureau, Ohio Grange, and founded the first county poultry club. So she, was, she really was a farmer. She was also a master gardener. This is her degree of flora from the Ohio Grange. And one of the things she did in 1932 is downtown at Reich's, if you know the old Reich's store, their street level windows that used to have the Christmas decorations and everything. Well, she planted an entire victory garden in those windows. And she had tomatoes and all kinds of vegetables and would, and would hang around down there and advise people on how to do their own gardens and, and give them advice. And she had that set up in, the, in Reich's windows downtown Dayton. She was a gardener, and this was the garden club that she started. And there they all are sitting out somewhere under the trees, all dressed up. She didn't have her trousers on there, it doesn't look like. <laughs> and then she organized flower shows. And this is the garden club in front of the, uh, the uh, town hall, which was new back then, but it's the old town hall in the middle of town right now. And that's Ida right here. She had extensive gardens and landscaped hillside with, with limestone outside her house. And this is her relaxing in an obviously handmade arbor on the south side of her house. Besides all that farming stuff, here she is very dressed up with the, oh, with the Centerville Women's Choir that she founded. And this is her over here. And she, was, uh, she wrote music, she sang, she played music. So she was quite the musician too. And this is her in her mandolin and watermelon eaten society. <laughs> it's the only thing I could figure. That's her with her mandolin. We have her mandolin in the historical society today. But they sit around and play some stuff and eat some watermelon and have a good old time. She was quite the lecturer. She lectured all over the state of Ohio, mostly on in farm-related programs. This is the Farmers Institute in Darby Township. But she would talk about rural problems and all kinds of farm-related issues. And in 1930 to 1940, she actually hosted a local radio program uh, in Dayton on farm subjects. This is another place, Farmers Institute, that she gave a talk at. Mrs. Weller is a farm woman who knows full well the burdens and limitations of the average farm woman. This is one of her slogans that we see often in her writings is don't get worried, get busy. And she was a writer. We have documentation of dozens of different uh, writing awards that she got and, and they're not local things. This is a national one. People from uh, Illinois and Arkansas and Charlotte, North Carolina. And of all of that, she was the number one. She won first place in that contest. So she was quite the writer. And she made money. Look at this, she made $5 uh, in, that, in that one. So back then, I guess it was worth a lot more. This is another award, True Story Opinion Contest. Back in 1932, we have uh, lots of her writings that she wrote, and they're, they're very interesting. Community organizer. Here she's listed from Centerville, Ohio, people from Enon, Columbus, and I'm not sure where this was, but it's obviously a community type of thing that she was, she was talking about. And there she is all dressed up, out of the chicken house, but she could get dressed up. This was an interesting one. She she felt bad for the farmers. She always had this, this empathy for the farmers who didn't get to see what the rest of the world was like because they were so busy. 
So none of them had ever seen, been to a movie. And this was in the days of the silent movies. So she started writing the owner of Lowe's Theater downtown Dayton, saying, I've got a bunch of farmers who've never been able to see a movie. I would like to, you to have a movie that I could bring them all to see it. And, and they wrote back and forth, and we had those letters, and he went back and forth, and finally he gave in and said, okay, you can come see him to this movie, Borderland with Agnes Ayers, a silent movie. And she got all of these folks together in the horses and buggies and hay wagons, and all went downtown in a big parade to Lowe's Theater and parked him out front, and they got to see their first and probably their last movie. But that's the kind of thing she did for the farmers that she thought needed a little extra something. This is a PTA project that she, she, she founded. And she said, the cry of hungry children resounding in their ears, women of the Centerville School District under the supervision of Mrs. Arthur Weller, last week canvassed all of Washington Township in an effort to collect farm produce which could be utilized in the Dayton and Montgomery County Council of the PTA. So she got a bunch of guys with trucks to go around to all the farms in the area and load them up with tomatoes, corn, beans, cabbage, carrots, squash, and pumpkins, all of this excess food they had and distribute it to needy people through the PTA and the school system. So she was very nice to her own community. She also went, her and a bunch of ladies went downtown to the um, Board of County Commissioners to petition for a charter form of government. So it's just a, you know, kind of a political thing she was involved in. And Arthur died in 1950, and Ida died in 1952. Weller Elementary was named in 1959, and she said, we both love the sod and sweet perfume of sprouting grass, we like farm life. None but the loving souls are fit for the study of nature. So that's the story of Ida. And this is the school that's named in her honor. Now this is about her homestead. They called it Grassland because there was a lot of grass there. And this is a picture of 1920. This is the house uh, very much similar to what it is today. And there's one, two, three, four barns you can see, and there's another one that's not in this picture. This one blew away in a tornado. This was all farmland out in front. Today it's trees and a lawn, but it was a very active farm in its day. The house and the whole property was built by Samuel Wilson in 1840. And we actually went downtown to the records place where they have the big ledgers and we knew the lot numbers and everything and looked it up and sure enough it said in 1940 it said house four hundred dollars and so we proved because there was some discussion on whether it was really 1840 but we went down and proved it with the records samuel wilson passed it on to his daughter who was the widow kelsey and her husband charles kelsey so it still stayed kind of in the wilson family and then they sold it to Arthur Weller in 1910, which was the second family to live there. It was then passed on to his son, Robert and Bernita Weller, and then finally to daughter, Judith Weller, who we bought the place from. And we bought it in 2005. So in over 180 years, there's only three families that have owned the place. And because of that, it stayed very original. There hasn't been a lot of changes and renovations and all those kinds of things going on. The house is, is still pretty authentic as it was a long time ago. It's now a Centerville landmark property, so it's under the protection of, of the um, Board of Architectural View, just like the historic buildings in the center of Centerville. Here's some horsepower out in the front yard cutting some hay, 1920. This is in 1920, this is what the back of the house looked like. And this is the main door that goes into the kitchen. Pretty sad looking in those days. There's a well right here. And uh, I asked Judy why there wasn't a pump on it. She says, oh, we didn't drink out of that well. You can see these cans, these are like milk cans. They lowered those down with a pulley and that was how they kept it cold before they had refrigeration and electricity. So that was a well that they just used to keep things cold 
it wasn't for drinking water. This is that same look today with a little bit of spit and polish and work and a new little porch that we put on. This is the backyard. This is the carriage house that we were told when the preacher came on Sundays, he'd pull his horse in there and tie his horse and buggy up inside the carriage house before he came in. This was a, a building we were told was called the wash house and it was for laundry and butchering hogs. Quite the combination. Here's that well again with the, with the cans sitting beside it. This is an interesting building. Most people think that the big brick town hall in the center of Centerville is the original town hall. It, it's not, it's the second one. This was the first one. And it's very much like a barn, it's all wood. And that sat where McDiggers, the bar McDiggers is today. That's where this was. And underneath McDiggers is still the limestone foundation that held this barn. So when they built the new brick town hall in the center of town, they were gonna bulldoze this. And a Weller said, nah, it's a good building, we can use that. So they moved it out to the farm and had cows in there and used it for a long, long time. It's gone now because it was wood, it was very deteriorated. And when the size of the estate got reduced down, uh, that, was, that went away. Here's some guy in a Model T, I don't know if that's a Model T, old car in the front yard. These are representations that my wife did with an architecture program showing the evolution of the house. This was just a standard brick farmhouse. And in 1850, there was a timber frame addition on the end to add a couple of stories. And in 1870, there was the north timber frame addition. And there were some porches added at a little later date. And we have some old photos and some actually some blueprints that we got this information from. So we're pretty sure this is how the, how the house evolved over the years. And there was a side porch and a kitchen. These big pillars here were added in the 1926 when it was kind of a fad to add pillars onto old houses, like the Brooker's house big pillars in front. You'll see several places around town that have pillars, and those were added later. This is when indoor plumbing came in, and these additions added kitchens and bathrooms because they had indoor plumbing in the 20s. And this is what the house looks like today. And you can see this center part here. That's the original brick farmhouse. The front of the house was originally in there, and as the additions were added, the front door became this. This has a one in front of it. There's a two here, and there's a three back here because this was divided into three apartments. But it's a very solid house. The house we moved from was 10 or 15 years old in Beaver Creek, and already the windows were kind of getting funny and the siding was kind of, these are original windows from 1840. And the house is solid, so. It's true, they don't make them like they used to. This is the carriage house from the front. This is the big barn, we call it. And this was built in 1840. This part in front was added a little bit later. This chimney was, they had a blacksmith oven in the corner here. And originally we believe the foundation was limestone and at a later date was changed to concrete to keep it in better shape. This is a barn sale we had one time to benefit Centerville, Washington history. It was very successful. We loaded it with stuff from everywhere and, and sold everything. And one little lady that lived out on the street next to us came because we had signs out front and said, barn sale. She says, are you really selling your barn? <laughs> I go, no, no, just the stuff in it. This is every year we have all of our relatives from all over the country fly in for like a family reunion. And we have dinner for 40 every year at Thanksgiving. And this is what it's all decked out like. And we have all the chairs and tables. And over on this side, we have a buffet table that we, we have a couple of turkeys and a ham and all the sides to go with it. So, and we've 
used it for a couple of grandkids' weddings and some charity events. Uh, so it's a nice venue for doing things and we don't rent it out for profit. We just offer it for anybody that needs it for something. This is the back barn, we call it. Had farm equipment in it. It also had some chickens in it, I, I believe. Today it has all kinds of stuff in it. There's that wash house that was in the backyard and they moved it over and hooked it onto the end of the chicken house and that was the sales office. There was a phone and a desk in there and a little conveyor ramp that went to an underground cooler where they washed and stored the eggs. So when someone would come, they shoot the eggs up that little, that little ramp. There was a signal out in the driveway so when someone came in, it rang a bell. So they'd know if someone was coming and they'd, they'd go out and sell them some eggs. This is piles of stuff that I find and hang on to. These are old rusty things that me and the grandkids found with a metal detector. Some of it was stuff that was in the barn. This is an old plate from the Civil War era that was underneath in a crawl space in the house. Every time I put a shovel in the ground, I come up with pottery shards and I just think they're interesting. So I, I keep them because they're so valuable. <laughs> and this is, shows the chicken house, how long it is, and the little house on the end. Two or three different places here as the chicken house was extended, it was always written in the wet cement, initials, somebody's name, and the date. And the first one is 1916 right in here. And there's a couple others written in the, as they extended the end of this. So no chickens in it today because this is only four acres now and you have to have five acres or more to have farm animals in Centerville. So no chickens anymore, but I've got lots of other critters to keep me company. This is the landscape. This is the, the one corner. This is the southeast corner. This is the hillside beside the chicken house. This is a garden that uh, we share with five of our neighbors that's a lot bigger now that we all get together and we each got a little box and we grow all kinds of good stuff. This is what's left of some of the gates and the farm fences that I thought were interesting to keep around. These are just a few of the almost 50 wildflowers that I've found all over the place. Many of these are not really wildflowers. They're just there from when Ida planted them. These are blooms on a tree called a cinema triloba, and those are pawpaws. Does everybody know what pawpaws are? They're wonderful. They're hard to come by. You'll never find them in a store because they have a shelf life of about three days and then they're spoiled. So if you're lucky enough to find them, they're very delicious. Uh, I've got a huge crop of them and they're the largest indigenous fruit in North America. All other fruits, apples, oranges, pears, peaches, those all came from other continents and were brought to the North America. These are the only ones that were native to North America. The Indians used to live off of them. And these are the selection of wild fruits, I call them. There's the pawpaws. These are puffball mushrooms. They get as big as a soccer ball and they're edible. You can slice them and fry them in butter and they're very edible. And these are my favorite shaggy mane mushrooms. Those come out in the fall and I have lots of mushrooms, but those are the only two I mess with because they're very distinctive and you know that these are safe. Other mushrooms, you don't know <laughs> if they'll kill you or not. So, And then these are elderberries. And one year I tapped, I was told that they used to make maple syrup. And so I went out and drilled some holes and stuck a bucket on it. And a bucket that size, I would hang it on there in the morning on the way to work. And when I came home from work, it'd be overflowing. And then you start boiling that sap. And it was a fun thing. I ended up with about that much in a little jar, but uh, <laughs> it was fun to do. These are the critters. We have deer all the time. We have does with their little fawns. We have the bucks every once in a while. That's our dog playing with a baby groundhog. We never knew groundhogs could climb trees until we found this one up in a peach tree. Just ran right up the trunk. This is a little raccoon peeking out of an apple tree. These are, there's a little fish pond that had goldfish in it. 
And this is the bird that ate them all. Those things fly around neighborhoods looking for little fish ponds because that's easy pickings. This is one of our projects in the house. Uh, this is the main fireplace uh, that was in the center of the original farmhouse that was used for cooking and heating. And it was all sealed up. There was all black concrete across there. This was all sealed up. And one day we started picking at the corner of it just to see what was under there. And sure enough, we could see the broken up bricks from the original hearth. And so we started picking all that up and, and dug all that up. Then we started picking at the side of the fireplace and you can see it, bricks caved in. This was the only chimney that wasn't covered. So as we took the concrete and stuff out of the front, 150 years of rotted leaves and chickens and bird poop came shooting out of that thing. And Susan was running around with sheets trying to save the furniture was in that room. But we got all that cleaned out. Good friend of ours restored the bricks to the fireplace. Uh, so that's all good again. Here's Susan putting new bricks in the hearth because the, the bricks that were in the hearth were all just completely crumbled. But these are original bricks that we took from another part of the house that we we're working on. So they're original bricks to the house, but uh, new to this hearth. So after we did all that, that's what the fireplace ended up looking like. So it's back to its original form that was that's what it looked like in 1840. And this wooden mantle is also from 1840. So we did that just for looks. It's now sealed up. We don't use it for anything other than just looks. This is one of the walls that we had to do work on and we took the plaster and lath off. And this shows what that timber frame construction on the two additions looks like. And it's all super huge timbers, all mortise and tenon. You can see there's, there's pegs that hold it together. There's no nails, no other fasteners in this. It's all just timbers with mortise and tenon joints holding up the whole addition with a second story on top of it. It's magnificent woodwork. This is Ida's original desk that Judy Weller gave us. It's a beautiful piece that the, uh, the desk pulls out. We've got some of her original writings in there. This is another table that was from Ida's place. And that's the end. And this is a pump that we sat there so it looked like a well. But again, that's not what they had there, so it's, it's not authentic, but it looks like a well. Any questions? Where is this property? It's off of Clio Road, halfway between Alex Bell and Franklin, back in a new neighborhood. So it's Forest Walk neighborhood right off of Clio. Unfortunately, there's no way you can drive around it and see it. It's all back in the woods off a of private drive. So it's kind of hidden from view, but we like to give tours. So uh, if you ever like to see it and can get a hold of us, we can show you the place. And how were you made aware that the property was available? My lovely wife had a habit of reading that real estate thing in the Sunday paper. And that's why we moved several times. And, <laughs> but we saw this one and it was, it talked about a farm with barns in the middle of Centerville. And we go, because we kind of knew where Centerville was, but we couldn't imagine where that could be. So pure curiosity, we drove out to an open house one Sunday and saw the place and it was gorgeous, but it needed some work. Uh, there was no air conditioning in it, for example. They had an old oil uh, furnace with radiators. And in the second story of that house, when it gets above 60 degrees, you couldn't go up there to be so hot. Uh, and it wasn't easy, but we found a company that could put ductwork, because the brick walls, you can't put ductwork in them. So we found closets and corners and uh, 